and welcome to Windows in Time, the Greatest Generation, uh, Medford in World War II, presented by Jackson County Library Services and the Southern Oregon Historical Society. I am Leah Pastizo, a digital services specialist. This program is being recorded. So once again, please mute your microphone and turn off your camera if possible to ensure quality recording. There will be a timer, a time to answer your questions at the end of the program if you leave them in the chat or we, we can take questions at the end. <clears throat> Jackson County Library Services acknowledges that its libraries are located within the traditional lands of the <clears throat> Shasta, Tekelma, and Latgawa people whose descendants are now identified as members of the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians and Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde as well as of the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians and Modoc Nation who were forced to relocate to Oklahoma. The result of forced relocation and genocide is that Jackson County is no longer a population center for these specific tribal groups. As of the 2020 census, 4.6% of the population of Jackson County has some indigenous heritage. While this is more than twice the national average, it is a precipitous reduction from the pre-colonial 100%. We acknowledge that indigenous groups are too often relegated to the historical past when in truth, indigenous people are essential members of the Jackson County community. We take this moment to recognize the indigenous peoples whose traditional homelands and hunting grounds are where residents of Jackson County live today. We encourage you to learn about the land you reside on and to join us in advocating for the inherent sovereignty of indigenous people. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. Today's presenter is Larry Mullally. Larry is going to be introduced by his wife, Alice. Thank you, Larry and Alice for being with us today. My name is Alice Mullally. I'm a volunteer with the Southern Oregon Historical Society, the co-sponsors of the Windows in Time series. And we welcome you. Um, look at your watches. At four o'clock today, the end of the gala auction online is happening. If you haven't yet bid online, you can go to sohs.org which is on the screen up there. And that will lead you to the auction site where you can bid on any number of wonderful items we have. Uh, adventures, experiences, artwork, a nice massage, uh, great food packages. There's all kinds of wonderful things on the auction, but it all ends online today at four o'clock. So you have to do your bidding before that. The second thing I wanna mention about the Historical Society is for those of you who are gardeners, uh, the annual heritage plant sale will be at Hanley Farm on uh, April 30th and May 1st, the last, very, very last weekend in April. And you will have the opportunity then to plant a piece of history in your own garden because we propagate plants from the historic Hanley Farm. And it's a, a wonderful event. It usually is a gorgeous day. I don't know why, but um, come on out and enjoy the plants. So that's the pitch. Now I also get to introduce the speaker whom I know quite well. Um, Larry Mullally is a railroad historian, but he also has very close ties um, with and knowledge of local history. So various topics, as any good researcher gets interested in whatever comes along and local history has come along for us a lot. He's given several windows and time talks over the years on various topics and is on the Southern Oregon Historical Society Board of Trustees. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Larry Mullally. Well, good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you see this presentation, uh, which has a, a large number of, uh, of um, illustrations, uh, a good number of them are from uh, Common Domain on the website. In other words, you could 
find them and put, the, put portions of this together. But most of them deal with, are from Medford itself. And all of those come from the Southern Oregon Historical Society collection, which is maintained with the help of Jackson County Library Services. So the research library is a joint effort between the library in which you're sitting and Southern Oregon Historical Society, which physically the library is about two blocks from here. Uh, it also is based on oral histories. And oral histories were taken by people just as yourselves many years after the events of World War II. And they're recalling what they saw and what they lived. And that's very important as I'll explain at the end for this kind of history, because it gives you very much the person in the streets perspective of what life was like. Finally, there are large numbers of posters on display. And uh, when you see them in the pictures, they all look like uh, eight and a half by 11, but in, actually, in actuality, they're often very large, two or three feet wide and three or four feet tall. And they're beautifully preserved. And this very large collection of impressive wartime posters is at Southern Oregon University. And I think you'll, Southern Oregon Historical Society. And I think you'll appreciate them as they go along. So now we're just gonna switch over and see if we can get ourselves started here. In late August, 1942, crowds flocked to Medford's Rialto Theater to see a much awaited movie starring Greer Garson and Walter Pidgeon. The film's name was Mrs. Miniver and it would later win six Academy Awards, including Best Picture. The story is set in a small British town and tells of a young housewife and her rose garden. Mrs. Miniver struck a peculiar, a particular chord among American audiences, above all in its final scene in which a memorial service is held for vi villagers that have been killed by bombs dropped by the German Luftwaffe. In his memorial sermon in the film, the pastor asks why these innocents had to die and then describes the particular nature of this struggle. This is not only a war of soldiers in uniforms, he says, it is a war of the people, of all the people, and it must be fought not only on the battlefield, but in the cities, and in the villages, in the factories, and on the farms, in the home, and in the heart of every man, woman, and child who loves freedom. The music in the movie then swelled to the anthem of land of hope and glory, which we know better as pomp and circumstances. And through the bombed out roof of the church, Flight after flight of British fighter planes could be seen passing overhead in victory formation. And the audience in the movie theater cheered. This presentation is a story of a little part of that war as it was played out in the lives of the citizens of Medford, Oregon. At the beginning of the 1940s, Medford, Oregon had a population of barely 11,000 inhabitants. Most adults had only a high school education, money was in short supply, and it was rare for someone to buy a new car. The effects of the depression were still evident and folks had learned to make do with little. The daily rhythms of life were slower then. The mailman, the milkman made their daily rounds. Once a day, a train arrived bringing in the mail and the Portland newspapers and the national magazines. But Medford was still a small community. It did not have a single stoplight. Folk knew one another an office worker stopped at the magazine counter of City Hall across the street from the Elks Club to buy gum or cigarettes. To go shopping, most people walked. I did a lot of walking 
a woman who was young, a young housewife at the time recalls. In the neighborhood, the streets were muddy, rough, gravelly. Young people walked to school. Phyllis Skinner's father, a dairy farmer, drove her to Medford High School each day, but she always got out of the truck several miles from her destination so she could arrive on foot like everyone else. There had been, however, some premonitions of conflict. In October 1940, all males between the ages of 21 and 34 were required to register for the draft. A year later, Medford experienced a blackout in which all the lights of the city were briefly turned off. But fundamentally, America seemed secure behind its wide ocean, protected by its great Navy. And Charles Lindbergh had assured the American public that Japan could never be a dominant air power. And in 1940, both presidential candidates had pledged that American boys would never be sent to war. Great armies were fighting in other parts of the globe, but the conflict seemed a million miles away. So it was until 1126 Pacific time, a cool, cloudy Sunday morning of December 7th, 1941. When a football game on the radio was interrupted by the flash announcement, the White House says that the Japs had attacked Pearl Harbor. Within a day, President Franklin Roosevelt delivered his day of infamy speech and Congress declared war on Japan. As dazed Americans struggled to understand what all this meant, they were assured that, quote, our defense forces were not caught by surprise and that the nation was ready. But nothing was clear. And with each passing day, the news got worse. Singapore, Hong Kong, Corregidor, and the Philippines quickly surrendered. The air was pervaded by a fear that was given voice by the Oregon governor who warned, we may be attacked next month, next week, or tomorrow. So we must prepare now. And as best they could, Medford citizens girded for war. Civil defense volunteers encouraged families to put sandbags on their roofs for fire and keep reserved water in bathtubs to deal with incendiary bombs. Electricians, water system crews, and rescue teams were organized into rapid response groups. Air watchers were organized to scan the skies for enemy bombers. Quote, in this critical time, people were told, all stations must be constantly and effectively manned. 32 aircraft observer posts were quickly set up in Jackson County, staffed day and night by over 1,300 men and women volunteers. Nighttime air raid drills took place, signaled by fire whistles blowing two minutes of intermittent blast, during which people were instructed to turn off all house lights and get away from windows and under tables. And things were happening very quickly. For six months prior to Pearl Harbor, Medford City Council had been haggling with United Airlines over renting tarmac space. Now in less than a month, the city offered to lease the United States Army, the airport's complete terminal building for a dollar a year. And in early January, the War Department announced that a 50,000 acre training facility, soon named Camp White, would be established in the Agate Desert 10 miles east of the city. Its population would be four times that of Medford. Engineering offices for the huge project were set up in Medford's Sparta building at the corner of Main and Riverside. 
and soon thereafter, Medford was inundated by thousands of civilian construction workers brought in from California and Nevada. Housing shortages for the men building the camp were acute. Spare rooms, back porches, and garages were turned into sleeping space. A tent city was created where Med North Medford High School now stands. Men worked in day and night sh shifts for six months, three eight hour shifts. You could work with your shift, a laborer recalled, and then go home and come back and the whole picture would have changed. A new foundation would have been formed, a building formed where there were only a few days earlier, where there was only a few days earlier, a stack of lumber. And in less than six months, the camp was ready for, to receive occupants. As the building of the camp went forward, America prepared for total war. As companies converted to wartime production, the manufacture of bicycles, toys, lawnmowers, stoves, and electrical appliance ended. The production of tin cans, electric bulbs, and razor blades was greatly reduced. To conserve metal, even zippers on boys' pants was done away with, replaced with buttons. I had boys, a Medford mother recalled, and buttoning and unbuttoning those little jeans was something else. All aspects of life were affected. In May, 1942, compulsory sugar rationing began, followed by limitations on coffee, meat, canned fish, and cheese. And in December, gasoline for most Americans, giving them a rations of three gallons a week were put in place. To reduce the demands on railroads and trucks for moving vegetables to market, home gardens were converted to victory gardens to raise vegetables. And often neighbors pooled their resources and formed garden cooperatives on unused plots of land. Reminders of the conflict were everywhere. To read a newspaper, or a magazine meant reading about the war. Medford's two papers were filled with the names and places that people had never heard of. And it was very hard for readers to determine what was significant and what was not. The one thing that was clear was that America was engaged in a life and death struggle and that its outcome was uncertain. In June 1942, the government took control of all video news media. Henceforth, scripts and video clips adhered to policy lines developed in Washington and constantly repeated two themes, the bravery of our American service boys and the sacrifices needed on the home front if victory was to be won. Only rarely was the news encouraging at this time. But that June in 1942, it was announced that American naval forces had defeated the Japanese Navy near Midway Island, 3,000 miles west of San Francisco. And it was in this context, a few weeks later, that the enlisted men and officers, over 20,000 in all, of the newly reactivated 91st Infantry Division, with many of its soldiers coming from Southern and Eastern states, flooded into Jackson County, Oregon, and were transported by rail directly into the new facilities at Camp White. For young soldiers away from home for the first time in a camp they nicknamed Alcatraz because of its isolated environment, the lights of Medford were gleaming beacons, drawing them in whenever they could obtain leave. And to Medford they came, a flood of humanity unlike anything the city had ever experienced. A young woman at the time later recalled, 
If you went downtown day in and day out, you had to just mill your way through because of the soldiers going and coming like four and five abreast that filled up the sidewalks in Medford. Servicemen were everywhere in Medford bars, eating houses and movie theaters. Getting a seat on the bus was hard, a resident later recalled, because soldiers would take up all those spots. On some nights, the USOs were so crowded that many soldiers could only stand on the sidewalk and whistle at passing girls. Vehicular traffic on Medford's Riverside Avenue was particularly intense. Quote, the trucks, the convoys of trucks would come through, just trucks, 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 miles of them would come through and you could stand and wait, sometimes up to 30 minutes for a convoy to get past. School children had difficulty crossing Riverside to get to school or get home. It would not be until midway through the war that the first street signals were installed. Incoming traffic had its own particular peculiar flow caused by civilian workers returning home from Camp White. Every evening, a Medford citizen recalled, folk got off work at Camp White around five o'clock. You would start seeing them streaming by. You would see the cars driving home through Medford and through Talent, but they weren't going very fast because the speed limit was 35 miles an hour. Complaints were made that Medford merchants were gouging the military by overcharging them. But soldiers often had more ready cash than civilians and suggestions that GI should be given free admission to watch the Medford Tigers football squad fell on deaf ears. Some things were seldom mentioned in polite conversation, but complaints went both ways. Servicemen were told that visiting a prostitute was equivalent to aiding the enemy. Medford was more staid than many other military towns, but it had at least two red light establishments in January, 1942. And after that, the army stopped counting. By the end of that year, Medford had become a magnet for people from all over the country, coming here to work or be near loved ones. The city's main hotels, the Jackson, the Holland, the Medford and the Grand were filled with officers and their wands. But any family that had a garage or a back porch or any free room that could be turned into a place for newcomers did so. The Medford Chamber of Commerce worked overtime to place newcomers. Quote, wives would come here from Georgia, a woman recalled, Iowa, Kansas, and all over, not knowing anything at all about the situation they were coming into. Another stated, I had a two bedroom house and a wood cook stove that was used by all the young mothers. And we shared babysitting. One would take care of all the children. Some of us did cooking. Some were doing laundry. Some of us were doing sewing. School soon became overloaded with kids and were often taught by substitute teachers in place of regular staff who had enlisted or been drafted. But despite all the strains, the community showed enormous goodwill for the boys in uniform. In time, four USOs were operating in Medford, served by young women in the role of dance hostesses. Churches also pitched in. St. Mark's Episcopal Church operated a card and game room every Monday night, every night of the week, and offered dancing every Monday evening. A Medford USO featured an Adopt-a-Soldier program during Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays, which a local family would invite a serviceman from nearby Camp White to a quote, real honest to goodness home cooked meal as the neighbors next door, end quote. Families adopted almost 500 men for Thanksgiving home dinners. Medford was truly generous. When a new USO opened at the corner of Riverside and 5th and 6th, 
the, in the former Gates auto dealership in 1943. 5,000 civilians joined the soldiers for the opening events, games, canteen offerings, and cookies. Not everyone, unfortunately, was equally welcome. In July 1942, the Medford News reported that 208 black soldiers of a housekeeping detachment were now at Camp White, but that, quote, most Medford soft drink places, beer parlors, and restaurants have refused to serve the Negro soldiers. The problem persisted until one of the city's most prominent families offered their home as a USO for black servicemen. By the spring of 1943, the allies were mopping up German and Italian forces in North Africa and fleets of heavy bombers were attacking Germany day and night. And on May 31st of that year, a massive military parade came up Main Street from the county course hunts. The army marching band led the way, followed by thousands of soldiers in battle dress. Then jeeps, anti-aircraft, anti-tank guns, heavy trucks filled with soldiers passed by. Followed by what seemed to be every organization in the city. Veterans groups, Red Cross volunteer nurses, Red Cross Home Service, Red Cross Motor Corps, Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts. But it was the last hurrah for the 91st Fur Tree Division in Medford. Soon thereafter, military police set up checkpoints on Highway 62 leading northeast over the mountains from White City. And civilians were warned that, quote, for the next months, roads will be jammed with traffic due to truck convoys. Within weeks, most of the barracks were deserted. Troops and equipment had been moved en masse to the high desert south of Bend for military maneuvers. The 91st Infantry Division never returned. It was sent to Italy and spent the remainder of the war in brutal mountain fighting. Four months later, another division, the 96th Infantry Division, that had finished a year of training already, arrived and was sent to Camp White. But since six months later, it too was gone, this time dispatched to the Pacific. Throughout it all on the home front, there was never a let up in the war effort. The nature of the national peril was constantly reiterated. The enemy were immoral, they were evil incarnate. And their leaders were caricatured, caricatured as dangerous buffoons. To achieve victory, everyone was asked to sacrifice or give time to collecting materials and give money. Every family was urged to contribute at least 10% of their income by purchasing war bonds for 1875 that would return $25 in 10 years later, 10 years later, if America won the war. Drives usually lasting about three weeks saw intensive activity in Medford. Booths manned by volunteers selling bonds were set up along Main Street in the lobbies of all the theaters and in supermarkets. And newspaper boys fanned throughout the city and sold 25 cent victory stamps that if accumulated might become a bond. Classes at school competed to sell the most stamps and bonds. And large posters with emotion laden images, laden images, urging Americans to buy bonds were prominently posted. Not to buy bonds was to fail the service boys. Air raid wardens visited homes asking if the family observed air raid instructions, salvaged essential materials, refused to spread rumors, and perhaps most importantly, whether the family bought war savings stamps and bonds on a regular basis. Households that met these criteria were allowed to display a victory home symbol in their windows. 
In all, during the war, there would be seven bond drives, each of them nationwide, that would raise hundreds of billions of dollars. And almost every drive was more successful than the previous one. World War II was perceived as a righteous but all consuming effort. Strong in the strength of the Lord, the poster reads, we who fight in the people's cause will never stop until that cause is won. The young were caught up in the conflict. Children less than five years old became adept at plane spotting and could often call out airplane types faster than adults. Christmas for many children meant old toys repainted for the occasion. To achieve victory, always spelled with a capital V, doing without certain things was taken for granted. My father fixed my shoes with cardboard. And mother sewed all my dresses, a former Medford High School girl recalled. And the threat of danger was never far from the children's minds. A poster of a masked and helmeted German soldier warned he could be watching you. Comic books passed from hand to hand also became part of the war effort. Superman fought Nazis or Japanese villains. As did Batman and Robin. In this picture, we're selling savings bonds while they were at it. The evening radio shows featured Captain Midnight, commander of the Flying Secret Squadron, dedicated to stopping the Nazis and the Japanese, or the Green Hornet, fighting spies and other evil figures. The daily newspaper comic strips featured wartime action. Young persons did not just read about the war ever, they engaged in it. Children went door to door gathering scrap metal, or enlisted in the Green Guard to watch the forest for forest fires caused by incendiary bombs. Girls were called to deliver daily newspapers or serve as nursing aides. And high school students were kept busy collecting metal, rubber, and newspapers. Others attended classes with the veterans of foreign wars to learn aircraft spotting techniques and served as aircraft watchers. And many young men enlisted in the military services before ever graduating high school. Some of the simpler joys for Oregonians were no longer possible. And the freedom of movement that we had all long taken for granted, such as travel by automobile to the ocean or to the mountains was almost impossible. A young couple from Medford drove as far as the Applegate River out of Grants Pass before deciding to return home, afraid that they would run out of gas. There were no new cars, Civilian automobile manufactured it ended three weeks after Pearl Harbor. Vehicles considered junkers, a teenager later recalled, could be sold for profit. The normal family was allowed only three gallons of gas a week. War on tires were recapped rather than replaced and inner tubes were patched. There were no new ones to be purchased. Even train tickets were difficult to come by and long distance travel, if it had to be done, was mostly done by bus. To save fuel and tires, a victory speed imposed a limit of 35 miles per hour and was mandated nationwide. In December 1942, the Jackson County Sheriff announced that warrants would be served for the arrest of all violators. Joyriding was considered unpatriotic. This Dr. Zeus cartoon shows a young teen speeding down the road with Hitler and Tojo in the back seat, urging him, step on it, kid. You got gas and rubber to burn. For civilians who worked in Medford, even getting home from work was difficult. In the heyday of Camp White, the Medford bus station at 6th and Bartlett was mobbed with young soldiers seeking to return to base every evening. 
The bus to Central Point, built for 21, was return, routinely carrying 50 riders, journalist Shirley Brenner humorously wrote. And these were, quote, sat on, pushed, pulled, squashed, stepped on, cussed at, apologized to, and knocked about until they wondered who or what they were. There was one great exception, and that was popular music that remarkably seldom had anything to do with the war. In 1943, the biggest song hits of the year were Swing on a Star by crooner Bing Crosby and Don't Fence Me In, performed by the Andrews sisters. But the most popular form of entertainment, going to the movies, inevitably involved a conflict. Most feature films dealt with war themes and many of the leading characters, as people would say at the time, quote, never came home. The ubiquitous March of Times featured half hour shorts on patriotic topics offered at every movie. Topics such as the Navy and the nation or show business at war or Americans all. There was some escape as fair but the war was never far from people's minds. Two girls took their mother to a Red Skelton comedy and she laughed for the first time in months. But afterwards she was in tears. For months, every day had been consumed by the woman worrying about her two boys serving in the army. And the Red Skelton movie had made her forget these concerns and she was remorseful that she had forgotten her boys even for that short period of time. In January, 1944, the Medford Mail Tribune listed those in the service from the county. Well over 3000 names, with every, virtually every family having a son or father in the service. In many cases, there were several members of the same family. On June 6, 1944, Medford awoke to the sounds of sirens and whistles announcing that the Allies had landed at Normandy. Fighting had now begun in France, but people knew what that meant. The long-awaited assault against Hitler's fortress Europe had begun. There were prayer services that day, but no celebration. The fighting would be intense, the casualties heavy, and Medford did not feel like a land of hope and glory. Signs of the war were now everywhere, and the windows throughout the town. Homemade blue flags could be seen indicating the number of family members in military service. The war was a background to everything. It was a dull throb, a deep awareness that regardless of whatever excitement wartime activity might arouse, it was deadly serious business. Losses were now being reported in the newspapers. The names were dutifully recorded in notebooks. Many were said to be missing in action, wounded or prisoners of war. Those that did not survive were described as killed in action. Walking through Medford, in addition to the blue starred service flags, one could now see other flags bearing a gold star hanging in the windows, the sign of a death in military service of someone in the household. And this too was accepted as the price of freedom. The pervasive sense of sorrow was reflected in a simple poem written during this time by a Jackson County sky watcher. It is a thankless chore as we keep the score for no medals bedeck our breast. All we can do is carry through. But when in the quiet of the cheerless night, we gaze at the heavens above, let us whisper a prayer for the lads over there and God's aid to the land that we love. And always there was the fear in the middle of the night of that dreaded knock of the Western Union messenger 
reading word. The telegraph read, the Secretary of War desires me to express his deepest regret that your son was killed in action on the 27th of July in France. Letter follows. The Adjutant General. Information released to the press seldom provided information as to how or where the death occurred. But the news kept clippings gathered by unknown hands and now brown with age hint at the grief caused by these losses. Joe Wurzer, Wurzer had won the Medford Elks Essay Contest on Americanization. Richard Hewitt, a bomber co-pilot, shot down over Luxembourg. Clement J. Haas, killed in, the Normandy, killed in Normandy a week before his 20th birthday. John Blakely, 25, survived by a wife and two children. Cecil Hunt had operated an ice cream parlor in Medford. His father had earlier been killed in combat. Ned Moss had enlisted in February and in August was killed in France. Ellen McClanahan was the eldest of six children. Tom Warren was killed in the Pacific on his 20th birthday. Harry Wilcox, the graduate of St. Mary's Academy, killed in action. Donald Stinson, 32, died at Midway. Daniel Wallen had graduated from Medford High School only a year earlier, and so it went. But in May of 1944, aircraft warning services of the aircraft watchers were closed down, no longer useful for defending against enemy bombers. And the volunteers were disbanded, but rationing remained in place. And many no longer observed as well as they once had the 35 mile per hour speed limit. Yet having fighting also continued in Europe and in the Pacific. In December, a major German offensive, later called the Battle of the Bulge, occurred in the snows of Belgium and heavy losses continued. Only the following spring did the war in Europe seem to be winding down. At the news of Germany's surrender on May 8, 1945, there was no public celebration in Medford. The event had been anticipated for several weeks, however, and newspaper advertisements had been made ready for the occasion. But without exception, every one of them expressed a resolve to continue the war effort. And that summer, the grim conflict went on and the death toll continued to mount. The end finally came, however, and only then did Medford rejoice. In the late afternoon of September 2nd, 1945, downtown Medford was a scene of celebration. Thousands of people milled about downtown. Paper confetti was everywhere. Many were intoxicated. The intersection of Maine and Central was jammed with cars and pedestrians. And in the neighborhood, little children beat pots and pans with metal spoons and cars of cheering people with horns blaring circulated through the streets. Two blocks away from Maine and Central, however, 400 people gathered in the Baptist church and more stood outside to offer thanks praying for the many servicemen who had taken part in the battles. But it was over. The worldwide conflict, the rationing, the war bond cells, the suffering, the bitter, bitter struggle had ended. But not without a final tragic loss. On the day that the surrender of Japan was announced, the battle cruiser Indianapolis was reported to have been torpedoed and had gone down with almost a thousand reported deaths. My talk today reflects dominant history. What history, what ordinary people of the time reported years later as they recounted their life in the war, or the attitudes reflected in the newspaper editorials and columns of the time. In short, 
reflects the lived experience of the vast majority of people they met with and tried to capture the spirit of that time. There are other stories that could have been told of war profiteers, draft dodgers, deserters, conscientious objectors, the internment of American citizens of Japanese. Some of these are big stories, some of these are less. The decision to use the atom bomb. But in their context, all of these other issues were far, far subordinate to the cause of winning the war. If we were to sum up the meaning of World War II in Medford, I would suggest that Hollywood said it as well as anyone in the final scene of the movie, Mrs. Miniver. President Franklin Roosevelt thought so and had millions of copies of the pastor's sermon translated and airdropped over German occupied territory. It was reprinted in Time and Look magazines and broadcast over the voice of America in Europe. And 80 years later, it still serves as an anthem for this generation. Before the sheer intensity and duration of their commitment to fighting the war on the home front, were never equal, was never equal before or afterwards. The minister explained, this is not only a war of soldiers in uniform, this is a war of the people, of all the people. It must be fought not only on the battlefield, but in the cities and in the villages, in the factories and on the farms, in the home and in the heart of every man, woman, and child who loves freedom. The greatest generation did this in an extraordinary way. So thank you.